and waited on us while we were um thought we were preparing, but um we'll get started so that we uh, um we can stay on time. Thanks, Zanetta. Good morning, distinguished guests, supporters, citizens of Louisiana and all others, welcome. I am Zanetta Augustine, program leader, a and r and it's my pleasure on behalf of Southern University Ag Center to welcome you to the USDA Debt Relief Update Webinar. The ag agenda is as follows. We have an opening by myself, the greeting by Dr. Orlando McMeans and Dr. Lisa Ramirez, We'll have introduction of speakers by Otis Hill uh, and Tarek Bowley. And then we'll have our speakers, Dr. Dwayne Goldman and Mr. Zach Duchanel. And then we'll have closing remarks by Allison Johnson and Deshaun Yark. Please put all questions in your chat box with your email address and a copy we'll be giving to Mr. Goldman and he will forward you an answer to your question. Also, we will have um, the last um, 10 to about 10 minutes of questioning on this webinar today. So let's turn our attention to um, the greetings by Dr. Orlando McMeans and followed by Dr. Lisa Ramirez. Thank you, Zanetta, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, it is indeed uh, my pleasure uh, to welcome you uh, to the USDA Debt Relief Webinar. I would first like to thank our partner, uh, USDA Farm Service Agency, and co-hosting what I deem to be a very important and relevant event. Uh, the purpose of this webinar is to provide information to socially disadvantaged and minority farmers and ranchers regarding the USDA's debt relief program, which is a part of the recently passed American Rescue Plan. As an 1890 land grant university, the Southern University Agricultural Research and Extension Center has a mission, and that is to provide research extension and teaching opportunities to the underserved citizens of the state of Louisiana. Just to give you an idea of what we're doing under the auspices of the Southern University Cooperative Extension Program, the Agriculture and Natural Resources Program area, or ANR, serves 34 of the 64 parishes in the state of Louisiana, maintains a database of over 600 agricultural producers and growers, and has provided grower school training, farm demonstration workshops, fact sheets, and educational handouts to train socially disadvantaged farmers. Additionally, the ANR program area has trained and certified over 2,200 individuals in sustainable urban agriculture, small business development, and food and farm safety. The Small Farm Institute will offer whole farm planning, training, and grow experience to farmers for successfully entry into the agricultural industry. Also, we received a grant for $400,000 to provide technical assistance along with, uh, and this is in partnership also with, with our uh, Southern University uh, Law Center, where we will provide uh, counsel to around family legal issues to our clientele who lose their property and their farms. And so we, this is something big, not only in the state of Louisiana, but also a lot of the other states where 1890s are located. The Southern University Cooperative Extension Program has a longstanding partnership of over 25 years with agricultural community-based organizations around the state. Uh, some of these include Morehouse Parish Black Farmers and Landowners Association, St. Helena Cattle Company, Community Cattle Enterprise, and Agroman Incorporated. And last but not least, the Southern University Cooperative Extension has developed a statewide strategic plan to better position ourselves to provide progressive services to small and disadvantaged 
farmers of Louisiana. I want to thank my ANR team. I want to thank the leadership of Dr. York, uh, because this is something that in which uh, extension programs need to pivot and become more flexible to address the emerging issues of the day. So I thank my team for uh, pivoting and making sure, especially during this pandemic, to uh, understand that there are some needs for the clientele and stakeholders and the communities that we serve. So, so as you can see, uh, we are truly working on fulfilling our mission of research, extension, and teaching, which is our tripartite mission. We continue to strive to impact and serve the citizens of Louisiana. Uh, before, before I forget, uh, in my closing remarks uh, at the end of this uh, webinar, I would like to thank our USDA partners, uh, Dr. Dwayne Goldman, uh, Senior Advisor for Racial Equity, and those of you probably heard us talking earlier, uh, he is no stranger to me, but more importantly, he is no stranger to the 1890 community. Uh, Dr. Goldman has been a staunch supporter, an advocate for the 1890s, their mission, and what we endeavor to do in the communities and students that we serve. So thank you, Dr. Goldman, as, as usual, for your commitment and service to the, the not only the 1890 community, but the land grant mission. Also, I would like to uh, thank uh, the uh, FSA administrator, uh, Mr. Zach uh, Ducheneau. And, and, and Zach, I'm gonna probably refer to you as administrator Zach from now on, cause I don't want to mess your name up. Uh, but <laughs> when I meet you face to face one of these days, we'll, we'll make sure I get that right. Uh, also uh, our team at uh, uh, Southern University Cooperative Extension Program, uh, Dr. Deshaun York and her leadership as vice chancellor, uh, for extension and outreach. Also, uh, you've already heard from Mrs. Zanetta Augustine, uh, Mr. Otis Hill, Mr. Bernal Muse, uh, Dr. Marlon Ford, and also Mr. Antonio Harris. And a special thanks to our USDA representatives for OPPE, uh, uh, Ms. Lisa Ramirez. Welcome to, to not only uh, USDA, but the 1890 community. And I look forward to communicating with you and our own uh, beloved uh, Miss Allison Johnson, who, who of course uh, is an alum supporter, and, and she is everything that 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 we endeavor for our graduates to be at uh, not only Southern, but from the College of Ag, and, and as well as uh, those individuals representing the Ag Center, and that that also goes uh, in hand with Mr. Tariq Bowley also uh, an alum and supporter uh, of uh, Southern University and Southern University Ag. Uh, so, so thank you, Mr. Bowley for, for being on. And, and uh, when you hit the ground here, you immediately start supporting everything that we we're doing from students to research to outreach. So thank you. Uh, uh, and we, we hope to work with you even more in the future. Uh, and as always, I would like to thank you, uh, the, the attendees. Uh, in closing, it is my hope that uh, this event will be informational, engaging, and useful to the success and future of our minority farmers and ranchers. Again, thank you for your participation and enjoy the webinar. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lisa Ramirez, and I am the director of OPPE, the Office of Partnerships and Public Engagement. OPPE was established to expand outreach to America's agricultural community and to facilitate facilitate greater access to USDA programs. Whereas our mission is to advocate and facilitate and establish these partnerships. Our goal is always to deliver a USDA and any other opportunities to our customers, our stakeholders, and all of our partners in order to address the challenging needs that we're facing in our nation. OPPE serves as the lead agent for USDA partnership and outreach activities to be able to coordinate with a variety of different programs. Those programs include, but are not limited to, the different pieces that you'll hear about today and you've already heard about this morning, but small farms and beginning farmer and rancher programs, the youth outreach. We also have the military veterans agriculture liaison and we have faith-based faith initiative 
those are some of the things that we're working on now. Of course, we will always want to include such programs that the secretary deems necessary as we work in the best interest of USDA and all of the people that we serve. I will also do another shout out for Allison as well. Um, she is one of a very important member of the team that has already helped me tremendously as I am onboarding in OPP. This is my fourth week there and I feel like Allison's already on my speed dial because of the type of work that they're doing in the field. They're on the ground and they're able to connect to all 17 agencies within USDA. But one thing that I think people don't always understand is that their work really is customized because it's contextual to the communities that they're serving. And so thinking about the needs that these different communities have and the different liaisons represent so many different areas of our country and knowing how to deliver on that service delivery plan and connecting you to what you need is critical in the work that we do. I want to extend an invitation to each of you if you ever have a question or something you'd just like to have a brain um, partner with just to think through some of these things, we invite you to reach out to us. We're here to serve you. We look forward to a continued partnership and anything that we can do and we're not doing, we'd love to do it. Anything we're doing, you'd love us to continue doing. We'd love to hear that as well. Thank you so much. And I hope that you enjoy the webinar today and that you find it useful as we move forward. Have a good day. Now we will have Otis Hill, U.S. Excuse me, Southern University Ag agent, farmer, and dear friend who could not be here today because of other, of other obligation to introduce Dr. Dwayne Goldman, followed by Terry Bowley, who will introduce Mr. Jack, excuse me, Zach Ducheneau. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Are we going to? Good morning. Okay. I am Otis Hill, Assistant County Agent for Sub University Ag Center. The gentleman that I'm about to introduce, him and I met each other over 20 years ago at a Monsanto Field of Excellence in Northern Louisiana. At this field day, this gentleman done such of a fantastic job on a soybean demonstration until I just had to go over and congratulate him. He worked for Monsanto for at least 20 years. And during that time, he also done outreach with the 1890 institutions and he worked with black farm organizations. Monsanto was bought out by Bayer. So this gentleman worked for Bayer for like two years. Then he decided, well, it's time to retire and become a full-time farmer. But that didn't last long because he went to work as the executive director for the National Black Growers Council. He is married to a lovely young lady by the name of Deborah, and they have two beautiful children. I would like to encourage and challenge each one of you. If you have a question pertaining to the relief package for minority farmers, please ask the question. He is just a people's person and he enjoy his work. I would like to present to some and introduce to others the new senior advisor for racial equity for the USDA in DC, no other than Dr. Dwayne Goldman. Wow. Otis, I think I owe you a quarter. <laughs> um, let me ask for a point of clarification. Do, you, do we want to go ahead and introduce Administrator Ducheneau now? I, I think someone's going to do it. Let, let's do that. Yes. Tarek? Absolutely. Uh, good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Tarek Bowley, and I am the Farm Loan Chief in Louisiana with the Farm Service Agency. 
I'll be introducing Mr. Zach Ducheneau with the Farm Service Agency. Mr. Ducheneau was appointed administrator for USDA's Farm Service Agency on February 22nd, 2021. In this role, Mr. Ducheneau will provide leadership and direction on agriculture policy, administering credit and loan programs, and managing conservation, commodity, disaster, and farm marketing programs through a national network of offices. Ducheneau previously served as the executive director of the Intertribal Agricultural Council, one of the largest, longest standing Native American agricultural organizations in the United States. Since the 1990s, he's held several positions at the IAC, working with the federally recognized tribes and their 80,000 Native American producers. He's also served as the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribal Council representative. He has spent his career educating people about the critical role of thoughtful ag finance, improved food systems, value-added agriculture, and foreign exports to respond to the enduring economic and social challenges facing Native Americans and reservations. Dushino continues to volunteer on the board of directors for Project Health, which is a nonprofit founded by his family to benefit local community problems by providing life lessons and therapy through horsemanship. He is one of many partners on the family's ranch on the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation in North Central South Dakota. Without further ado, let's welcome Administrator Zach Ducheneau. Now, Mr. Goldman. Okay. Um, Thank, thank you all uh, to Dr. Ramirez, uh, Allison Johnston, my colleagues now at USDA. Dr. McMeans, it's always a pleasure to, to interact with you and, and uh, the good folks at Southern and to my, I call him, I call him my brother, Otis Hill. A little known story that Otis and I are twins. We were born on the exact same day. It took us about 10 years to figure that out, uh, but we're twins in a lot of other ways. And what I want to what I want to say to Otis and the rest of my friends is that uh, I, I don't know Zach's birthday yet, but I do know that uh, we often refer to, uh, to each other as brothers because I found out that when I was uh, with the National Black Growers Council in particular for that year, Zach was at the, at the, uh, uh, at the, at the inter, inter tribal council and, and we were doing a lot of the same work. So. Two months ago for me, maybe three months ago for Zach, we likely would have been on that end of this communication. And we probably would have been raising hell because of the frustrations that we have experienced with USDA. And that's what we're bringing to USDA in a new administration uh, with, with, with a specific goal. And uh, I, I saw Dexter Gilbert on, on the line, glad to see him joining in, I'm going to pick on him because I'm going to say something that I said last week at a similar meeting in Georgia. Uh, and I want to put this in perspective. And I'm putting this in perspective for President Biden, who, who appointed me to this position, for Secretary Vilsack, who confirmed that appointment, uh, but, but also for, for us. And this notion of racial equity is a serious commitment. This is, the, this is the first time that this position was created. And I think, Zach, if I'm not mistaken, this might be the first time that we've had a farmer of color, a Native American, as FSA administrator. And, and, and I think that goes to the uh, seriousness of this commitment. But I want you to think, uh, and I know a lot of people on the phone, I know your stories. You probably know mine. I'm a third generation farmer. Uh, the fourth generation were slaves, in my case, in Alabama. Uh, um, and that's, that's, as Black farmers, that's our history. Uh, for Native Americans, you know, uh, you were here before anybody, and you were sequestered into smaller areas, and you made a good living of it. For Asians, Latino farmers, uh, they have their own histories, rich histories, but just for a second, I, I want you to uh, uh, 
figuratively close your eyes and just think about what agriculture would look like if we had never had discrimination. If those recently freed slaves didn't have to go through Jim Crow and uh, intimidation and, 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 and murder and, 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 and be forced off their land, what would agriculture look like? If the Native Americans had really been given a fair shot at doing their craft, what would agriculture look like? Well, for one, you, you wouldn't need a senior advisor for racial equity because we would already be equitable. We're not there, folks. And I'm not gonna lie to you and try and sugarcoat it. We're not there, but our goal is to get there. So I, I joined USDA March 1, not planning to join. As I said, I plan to be on that side of it, advocating and making sure that the department was doing what it needed to do to make people whole and to stop the discrimination. I didn't realize it at the time, but shortly after I joined, we were presented with a study that said that uh, discrimination in this country over the last 20 years has cost this country $16 trillion. That's with a T. $16 trillion is the cost of discrimination. And the other side of that is we are now, we're in agriculture and we are in a world that's growing in population. Dietary purposes are changing. So it's not about enabling one farmer to be better than another as much as it is about enabling all farmers to be the best that they can be at feeding and fueling and clothing a growing world population. So it's not an option of stopping this madness of discrimination. It's a requirement. And that's the way Zach and I look at it. March 11th, uh, for the first time, the House Agriculture Committee was headed up by a black congressman, Congressman David Scott out of Georgia. And you, you guys are probably aware of the fact that there was a justice for black farmers bill circulating, Senator Elizabeth Warren, uh, Senator Cory Booker, Senator Warnock, Reverend Warnock, were looking at this justice for black farmers bill and then some information came to light that in, in, in the prior administration's uh, attempt to make farmers more whole through providing some CFAP payments. Social disadvantaged farmers essentially garnered about 1% of those benefits when they comprised 10% of the population. Black farmers comprised about a tenth of a percent when they comprised about 2% of the population. So when you have inequities like that, when you, ha you, you have to look at the root causes of that disparity. And so one of the ways that we're addressing that is by implementing a congressional mandate that you now call the American Rescue Plan. We're gonna spend some time today talking about two sections of that. And I wanna point out that they are the dollar amounts that are kind of earmarked for those are different. Section 1005 provides 4 billion to provide debt payments to farmers with a proven and well-documented history of being subjected to discrimination that leaves them inequitable. We also have a little over a billion dollars in section 1006. I think of that, we think of that as the restoration bucket. We are trying to use those funds to create programs, pilot programs, demonstrations, outreach, uh, that will prevent us from having a relapse to a point where we can be as disparate as we were recently. That's what this conversation is about. Uh, we look forward to the opportunity to share with you what we know. We also look forward to the opportunity to hear your questions so that we can take back and if we don't have answers to them, find solutions to them. Uh, so I'm gonna pivot to Mr. Ducheneau and let him go over some of the details in the debt payments, and then he'll pitch it back to me, and we'll go over uh, the some of the things we're thinking about in Section 1006 or the restoration plan. Uh, we should be able to do this in about 15 to 20 minutes, and uh, uh, Southern Dr. McMean's group has agreed to kind of monitor the chat box and keep us keep us whole. 
uh, we really want to hear from you. So I'm going to say that the only bad question is the one that you have that you don't get out and, and, and ask. Um, and the other thing, I put my contact information in the chat box uh, in case we run long. And I do have a hard stop at the top of the hour. But in case we run long, you have you have my contact information. Uh, Administrator Duchino you know, has, has also provided his, or I know he will. Uh, so, so if this is a conversation that needs to continue, we'll make ourselves available to do that. So, Mr. Duchino, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, my friend. Um, thank you to the folks at Southern University and all of you that have taken time out of the middle of your day in the middle of planting season or tillage season, whatever it might be where you're at, to listen to us and to help us build the future of the Farm Service Agency and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Louisiana has been heavy on my mind lately. I had opportunity to watch a Vice News story about the FSA in Louisiana. And I got to hear one of our own county committee members perpetuate the crap that's been coming out of the system's mouth about our inability to manage and our lack of ability to prioritize. And that just frankly, it really upsets me. I can't use those kind of words in the mixed company, but we're not gonna tolerate that. And Tarek, we're gonna get you some help down there that is more understanding, more inclusive of the way we wanna present ourselves at the agency. Dr. Goldman laid the found foundation for this conversation perfectly. And uh, it's been a pleasure to get to know him. I look forward to working more closely with all of you. Dr. Ramirez, Allison, all of the folks at the USDA, I'm really proud to be part of this team because with the American Rescue Plan Act, we have a chance to set the tone for the future by properly accounting for what has happened in the past. In the American Rescue Plan Act, we have the opportunity to make a payment on behalf of borrowers that are members of a socially disadvantaged group with a farm service agency direct or guaranteed loan and a farm storage facility loan that we handle that's managed by the Commodity Credit Corporation. But that's just the first step. And Dr. Goldman alluded to the, the amount of money that we anticipate going out in there. This is so important that Congress effectively didn't put a limit on it. CBO put a budget score on of 4 billion, but such sums as are necessary were appropriated. That's how important this was to, to our supporters in Congress and the president. And it's the beginning of a culture change at the Farm Service Agency. As Dr. Goldman mentioned, I'm the first Native American to ever hold this position. And it wasn't that long ago, as he mentioned, that I was on the other side of this conversation, just like you all, and raising hell is how he put it. That's exactly what we'd be doing. Wondering why we can't get this money out the dang door. And trust me, as someone who has just recently been in your shoes, we are doing everything humanly possible to get this out the door just as fast as we can along with all of the other things that the Farm Service Agency is doing throughout the country for all of our producers. We have the opportunity to pay up to 120% of that indebtedness. Well, that's gonna create some unique circumstances for a lot of our borrowers. There's gonna be tax consequences for all of that. So we're trying to be cognizant of that and make plans accordingly to align ourselves with folks like Southern University Federation of Southern Cooperatives in Indian Country, the Intertribal Ag Council, Indian Land Tenure Foundation, the National Latinos, Farmers and Ranchers Trade Union, Trade Alliance, so that we have the proper network of assistance out there to help all of our borrowers mitigate and manage this new reality that they've got so they don't wind up right back underwater with the IRS pounding them for some tax money. That being said, it's important to note that the payment of income taxes is an eligible use for farm service agency financing. What's really important about this particular program and this payment is it doesn't exclude you. Loan forgiveness in the past 
had meant that you couldn't participate in the programs anymore. <clears throat> That's why this is called a loan payment. And we are absolutely excited about welcoming all of our socially disadvantaged producers right back in the door with a brand new loan application to help you bring about economic prosperity for your operation, for future generations and for your community. Dr. Goldman also mentioned the, the, the hand that we've all been dealt. And I like to paint it in a little different light coming from the, the Native American population. If our, our European friends would have just paid attention when they drifted across the ocean and landed at the wrong place to what we were doing, we probably wouldn't be here right now. We'd have been doing climate smart agriculture. We'd have had resilient local and regional food systems. And it's the same in other indigenous cultures. So we had all of that going and now it's time to rebuild that. We have a unique opportunity in front of us because the administration has embraced a lot of those things that were climate smart ag, local food systems, resilient food systems, economic recovery and equity. My culture was very inclusive. My last name is French. You all recognize it from down there as a French name. My tribe welcomed those Frenchmen because they saw what we were doing and they said, hey, that looks like it's working out. I wanna be part of that. The tribe adopted them. That's how we got to have a lot of French names up in the, the Northern tier of tribes. There's two components to this American Rescue Plan loan payment program that we're, that we're managing as we try to get this out the door. We have a lot of control on the direct lending where it's the FSA managing our direct loan portfolio or managing the farm storage facility loan portfolio on behalf of the Commodity Credit Corporation. Those are kind of in one category. The other category is the FSA guaranteed loans. And we have lenders in that relationship. That's a little more challenging to navigate because in that our relationship isn't directly with that producer. Our relationship was with that lender because they said, well, we'll make the loan to these folks, but we need somebody to guarantee the debt. So that's the lender's role in there. We come in as the guarantor. But because we're party to that transaction, it was included in this American Rescue Plan loan payment program. Dr. Goldman and I have done several of these type of events. And I think that we've found that the best way to really get to the nuance of the, of the program is to start fielding those questions. And with that, I'm gonna answer the first question that always comes up because we can't give you the answer you want there, but it's coming. And that answer is when. Right now, all of the borrowers that we have verified as a socially disadvantaged borrower have received a letter or it should be in their mailbox today. That letter spells out the fact that, hey, we know you're there. There's nothing really you need to do right now. We're gonna reach back out to you once we get all the pieces put in place on our side of the transaction so that this can be as easy and as painless as possible. A lot of other borrowers who have no verification of race or ethnicity on file received a letter. We sent out a little over 23,000 letters. Some of those borrowers will take advantage of this opportunity to fill out the AD2047 form. That's how you designate your race, ethnicity, or gender. Race and ethnicity are the only qualifiers that get you into this program right now, but there are other things that we can do down the road with section 1006. Uh, and Dr. Goldman's gonna talk about that before we start to field questions. But the AD 2047 form is on our website. If you have a loan relationship with the Farm Service Agency or through a guaranteed lender, you're encouraged to download that form and submit it. If you're not certain that you've already made that designation of race and ethnicity. As Dr. Goldman put it at the last meeting, it's better to have two of them than none of them. So download the form, get it in. You can turn it in to Mr. Boley, uh, your local loan officer, if you've got a good relationship there. 
I bet there's someone at Southern University that could help you get that to the right place. My email is right there on my little window. You can email it to me and I will make sure that I get it to the right place so that you get counted and we can get your loan payments made as well. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Goldman to talk a little bit about section 1006 and then we'll start to listen and start to answer those questions that are burning on your mind. Thank you very much for the opportunity. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Mr. Ducheneau. And I'm just gonna reiterate a couple of things that, uh, that, he, that he just went over. Uh, early on, we were getting a lot, of, a lot of questions about the application process. And I'm gonna say it a little different way. There is no application process. FSA has all the records that it needs to execute and implement this debt payment. The one exception could be the AD 2047, which is a customer data worksheet where you would indicate your status as a social disadvantaged farmer. And, and I'll say this, I understand and I'm fully aware of the fact that prior to the American Rescue Plan, I could argue that why in the heck would I fill out the form? I don't want anybody to know I'm black because it gives them another opportunity to discriminate. I don't want to know I'm Native American. This is different. There is a very tangible benefit associated with you filling out that form correctly and putting it on file. I would encourage you to do that. It's online, it's at, it's at FSA, and, and we, to Zach's point, we created a system where if you have a uh, terse relationship with your local FSA office, you can go online and do it outside of that. And we have other resources to help with that. Bottom line, get the form in because the debt payment is uh, contingent upon having that form on file. I wanna talk a little bit about section 1006. Again, that's the restoration plan. And I get equally excited about talking about this section because after the debt payments are made, we should have about 14,000, 15,000 customers that are in a lot stronger position financially. And the way Mr. Ducheneau and I look at it, you could come right back to the door and apply for a farm loan and you should be treated fairly. And there's a, there's a few more people watching that process now than we perhaps we've had in the past. But, but 1.01 billion is out there for technical assistance and support, again, to keep us from relapsing to this position. About 20.5% of that, Congress has been very clear as to how those funds are to be invested. 5% for outreach, mediation, financial training, whatever we need to do to make sure that when we relieve, when we do the debt payment, that we don't put you in a worse situation with the IRS or in the case of a foreclosure or bankruptcy. We're not going to provide that advice directly from USDA, but we want to facilitate you getting access to that advice from people you trust and, 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 and to make sure that you're making the best financial decision you can as you uh, want to go forward with, you, with your farms and businesses, okay? There's 5% that goes to grants and loans and other things that are needed to clear up the heirs' property issue that's uh, disproportionately a problem in the Black farming community. I understand from Mr. Ducheneau that it has some similarities in, the, in, in Native American uh, circles as well, but there's 5% to deal with that. There is 5% that will be divvied up into the 1890, 1994, Alaska Native, the Hispanic, and the Territory Universities. Uh, there's a strong educational outreach component that, and I'm talking about Southern, that the 1890 community provides, and there's some funds in there to help you do more of what you do for research, extension, uh, creating uh, new and diverse talent for USDA and other areas of agriculture, so it's 5% for that. There's 5% that's designated to address prior injustices for social disadvantaged farmers. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say the P word. We had a lot of questions about Pickford and if this was a Native American artist, it might be Keep Siegel or Gar Garcia, but we filtered a lot of questions about that. I wanna point out that a critical difference between the American Rescue Plan and those class action uh, settlements was in those class action settlements, there was a burden of proof that the farmer had to bear in order to get access to the benefits. In this case, it's different. 
we can look at the numbers and see that something ain't right, that there is a, that, that there's disparate treatment and it's due to the cumulative effect of being historically denied access to resources and information and personnel that help you make good decisions for your farm. So because of that, we've got 5% that's, 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 that's to deal with prior injustices. And the final one that we've that we've uh, got to do is there's a half a percent, and that's a little over a uh, uh, million dollars to stand up an equity commission. And this commission will will be an external group of experts that will provide an external view of USDA, and they will hold our feet to the fire that we're doing what we're supposed to do, and we're well underway in doing that. There's other funds in there. And I'm looking at Dr. McMeans. I don't know that uh, that uh, Dr. Alton Thompson, who is the research director of the 1890s, Dr. Albert Essels, who is the extension director. Uh, but but we will work with you. Dr. Ramirez will be involved in OPPE, but we'll work with you to get a better fundamental understanding of those things that need to be done uh, to for, for the institutions and the customers. Uh, to address gaps that exist. Let me just pick on a couple of examples. We've heard from some of the vegetable growers that the lack of processing facilities is a bottleneck in them being able to tap into markets, um, contracts, that kind of thing. A, a well thought out plan that would address that inadequacy is something that, that we could really get excited about funding with those undesignated funds that are in there. But if you do the math, it's close to 800 million that we're gonna to do to remove these gaps. And our goal is to remove them permanently. We've got four years, three, three and a half now for sure. My, my, my goal, and, I, and I'm comfortable saying that Administrator Ducheneau's goal is to put things in place that will still be around long after we're gone. We're trying to make permanent change. And, and when you look at where we have to go from where we are, um, we've got some work to do. The good thing about it is we don't have to do it alone. We're counting on you to help us figure this out. One final thing before I switch to questions. We've been working very hard at implementing this American Rescue Plan to date. I think most of our efforts have been on doing a good job of the debt payments. If you think about what Zach just shared with us, when you look at a direct loan where all the information is at FSA, uh, that one is fairly easy to execute. When you look at a guaranteed loan that uh, has other banks involved, the dollar amounts may be a little higher. They may be in some level of uh, you know foreclosure bankruptcy. Those are a little more difficult. So hopefully you have an appreciation for the complexity of the cases that we're working with and it'll take some time to do this the right way. So the delays that we're talking about, it's not that we're delaying to figure out how we can't do it. The delay comes in figuring out how to do a good job of it. And when we do our best, I've got to think that somebody somewhere is probably going to fall through the cracks. I would hope that this network, I'm looking at 110 people on this call, and I'm hoping that this network will signal to myself, Zach, others, people that have fallen through the cracks, people that should have gotten the debt payment that for whatever reason uh, or not, did not get it. You've got my email address. If someone falls through the crack, you can send me an email personally. Now don't panic, okay? I need to say that. Letters went out this week. In fact, the meeting we had at the White House coincided with the release of those letters so people wouldn't be totally surprised when they got them. Um, but don't panic. Uh, those letters will kind of be staged depending on the complexity of the loan. But if three, four weeks have, have passed and someone hadn't gotten notified, I'd like to know about that so we can make sure that we reach back and get them so that no one falls through the crack. And that's a, that's a very prominent role that we will depend on the 1890 land grant community to help us work through. So um, the other things will be outreach, technical assistance, identifying gaps that we need to address. And that will be more of an ongoing working relationship. And we're excited about doing that. So I'll stop there and ask that uh, wh whoever's going to manage the questions, let's go ahead and get some of the questions.
addressed. Well, good morning. This is Allison Johnson, National Outreach Coordinator for the East with uh, USDA, Office of Partnerships and Public Engagement, also the USDA liaison at Southern University and West Virginia State. Uh, it's an honor to be here with, with my internal partners of USDA and also with Southern University, our land grant institution. So we're going to get started with the questions that have been presented in the chat. First question is from Marcus Dickey. I've made payments already this year. Will I receive those payments back at the time of debt payment? Yes. You, so the critical language in the, in the law is that indebtedness as of January 1st, 2021 is the figure we will use to calculate payment. So if you had a payment due on, Jan, uh, on February 1st and you made that payment, your payment is still gonna be calculated based on the indebtedness as of January 1st. So you will get that money back. Good question. Thank you. Next question is from an anonymous attendee. Do I have to continue making payments? I've already received my letter from USDA. Our position is that the USDA is not going to take any adverse actions against anybody during the pendency of this based on the guidance we put out in January on January 26th before the American Rescue Plan was even uh, contemplated or passed into law. Now, if I was the executive director of the Intertribal Agriculture Council, I would probably advise those borrowers, heck no, don't do that. Don't make a payment. Go get a disaster set aside. That's an option. We've got a COVID disaster set aside. But our official position is that we are taking no adverse actions on people who may be delinquent or behind on their payments. There, there is, there is a, another consideration there. Yes. And so you got, if you make the payment, you're gonna get the money back. If you are dealing with a, I can't say that word, let me think of one. If you're dealing with a person that's difficult to deal with as an FSA loan officer and they're putting pressure on you to do it and you can do it, uh, my, 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 my recommendation would be if you can do it, it, it's better to make the payment and get the refund than have some adverse action taken against you. Like you go, but, but to Zach's point, you, you do have other resources that, that you could do to, to delay that payment and not have to make it. Just make sure that you don't get tricked into getting yourself into a worse situation when, when you do that. And if there's something um, that sounds out of line, I, I want to know about it. If you go in and try and, and do the uh, do the do the um, the relief that Zach talked about, and 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 they're not working with you, we need to know about that. So, uh, and I got to add uh, one more thing to that, uh, Allison, if I may, and Dr. Bowman. If you have a guaranteed loan, your relationship is with the lender and not the Farm Service Agency. There are whole, there are a whole different set of circumstances around that. So if you've got a payment due to your guaranteed lender and you can make that payment, that's that's great. You will still get that money back in payment from the USDA, but we can't control whether or not an adverse action is taken up by that guaranteed lender. So that, that's, that's important to, to note. Guaranteed loans have a little different set of circumstances. Uh, she said, if, one of the things that we found out in the call we did the other move. night with the White House, there are still some guaranteed lenders that are taking adverse actions. And we want to know if you have a lender that's taking an adverse action against you, that's a guaranteed loan, or if you happen to be in bankruptcy, seeking bankruptcy protection, and they are trying to advance that case towards liquidation, get in touch with us email me, email Dr. Goldman, get in touch with Allison or Mr. Boley or uh, Dr. Ramirez, get some contact made with us so that we can get our folks working 
with that bankruptcy official, with that guaranteed lender, and try to forestall the loss of any further assets from our communities. Thank you. Next question. Can the American Rescue Plan provide funds to farmers who had major damage during the Texas winter storm to barns, storage buildings, and other facilities? And also, second part to Gwendolyn Wiley's, Wiley's question, is it possible for loans to be forgiven at some point? And I think you all have somewhat answered that. that. Yeah, and, and we really like to use payment instead of forgiveness because that kind of confuses the issue. In the past, debt forgiveness meant exclusion from the programs and these are loan payments made on their behalf to keep them eligible for the programs. With regard to the Texas winter storm, we have implemented several different disaster programs aimed at that. The American Rescue Plan doesn't address the winter storm damage unless you have an FSA director guaranteed loan or a farm storage facility loan, or if you're taking part in the food and ag production sector, the value added sector, there are some provisions in other sections of the American Rescue Plan that can provide assistance, but there's nothing that's gonna provide that urgent assistance that you need. You have to look to your county office, your state office, visit about the standing disaster programs so that we can get you some assistance there apart from loan, loan payments. Good questions. Are there any grants available to apply for? Dr. Goldman mentioned grants. Are there any grants available to apply for? at this time at this point we well let me back up we have not worked out the details on grants for the american rescue plan um uh, I'll, I'll i'll leave it open for dr ramirez to talk about the other programs that's under her jurisdiction but we have not um uh, worked out details on grants for the american rescue plan that will come later and I want to share with you that the reason we are holding up on that process is because as we're executing the debt payment, we already have been able to identify several issues that need addressing. Some of them are internal, some of them are external, but our grants should reflect those gaps that we've identified as we are doing these debt payments. But no, the grants have not been, the deep grant details have not been worked out as of yet. And I might just tag on to that one too a little bit, Allison. There are other programs within the department that have grant programs. So we've got the rural development. We've got uh, Ag Marketing Service. NRCS has some really valuable programs. They function like a cost share agreement, but they're effectively a grant of federal dollars to go do certain practices in EQIP or CSP. And if there's anybody that would like more information about that, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Bully can help you with that by referring you just across the hall, most likely, or you can get in touch with me and I can get you in touch with your local offices. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take a couple more questions and we are coming up on uh, five minutes still and I know we have some hard stops so we want to be mindful of your time. Will payments be made this year or into next year? I think we can safely say that payments will be made this year and we want to get them out as soon as possible so that producers have plenty of time to get with NGOs, nonprofits, universities in the land grant system that can help with business planning, help with tax planning, mitigate that tax consequence. So I, I think this year and ongoing, they will be paid because there is no time limit on this appropriation. It's such sums as are necessary until expended. Question from Stephen Slice or Stephen Slice. For clarification, does the actual legislation prohibit the IRS from pursuing collection of taxes based on the amount of debt forgiven? No, absolutely not. The, the IRS will pursue collection of taxes on this. And 
in the chat, I did see one person ask, what exactly does 120% mean? So just want to give a real quick dollar example. You have a $100,000 loan at the Farm Service Agency. If that's your balance as of January 1st, 2021, FSA will receive $100,000. You will receive $20,000 in, in your account. With that 20,000, you have to plan for your business, mitigate your tax consequence, what have you. But that's the dollars and cents of how this will break out. Okay, there are several additional questions in the chat. I'm gonna ask at this time, please uh, share your email addresses so that we can ensure we uh, get responses to you. Uh, there are a lot of great questions. Uh, just don't wanna choose one over the other. And I do know that we have several hard stops and we're gonna have some closing remarks by the panelists and, and then uh, Deshaun and I. Dr. Goldman? Yeah, I, just, I was trying to um, multitask and you caught me. I was looking through the chats, um, but there are a couple of questions I wanted to address that I saw out there. One was uh, concerning, it, it, it said equipment, but, but I would extend it to say that when this debt is paid off, anything that was used to collateralize that loan would be freed up. You would own that outright, equipment, land, whatever, these are farm ownership, farm operating loans. Any of that, uh, when that's cleared up, you will be debt free in terms of the collateral that was used to secure that loan. So I wanted to be very clear there. There was another one, a question about uh, loans that were closed before January 1. The short answer, Zach, I think is that the loan balance as of January 1, 2021 will be paid. And so it doesn't matter if that loan originated 20 years ago, or last year, whatever the case is, the loan balance of January 1, 2021 will be paid and you'll be freed up to do additional business with FSA. So I just wanted to, uh, I saw those two out there and just wanted to touch on that. And, and I just want to follow up on that one because one of the questions that we commonly get is, I was going through the process to get a loan right at the end of the year. My loan was closed, but I didn't draw down on the loan until after the first of the year. And in that case, the answer is unfortunately no. You had to have drawn the money into your account out of the treasury for use by January 1st, 2021. But what I can tell you is that you've got the commitment of the administrator of the FSA to make sure that that ongoing loan relationship you have with us is a comfortable and enjoyable experience because I've been in your shoes and I know how that wears on a person, but we're gonna make sure that Mr. Bowley and all of our other farm loan officials have the tools they need and the discretion they need to make sure we have great ongoing relationships. There was uh, one other question I wanna address because I don't know if we've, we've, we've been clear here. It's about how will the debt relief be delivered and and then there's another one, Zach, about whether you need to contact a bank on a guaranteed loan. If you'll take the second one, let me hit the second one, the first one right quick. So the on the on the debt payment, the the the, the loan balance is at FSA. So I'll use a hundred thousand dollar loan for sake of figuring. You got a hundred thousand dollar loan on the books at FSA as of January 1, 2021. FSA will get a check for a hundred thousand to pay that debt off. You, the borrower, will get a check for twenty thousand. Uh, and, and that'll come. That'll come to you. If, and if you have an account, probably probably direct deposit is is a, is the easier way to go. But I think our current thinking is that yeah, we the hundred thousand would go to FSA. The twenty thousand would come to the borrower, or the, or the, or the loan goes to FSA. The twenty percent goes to the borrower. Zach, cover that one on if they need to contact a bank about a guaranteed loan. You don't need to contact a bank on a guaranteed loan. We've already done that but it sure doesn't hurt in, a, in situations like this. It's better to do too much than not enough. And I think it's important to preserve that relationship with the lenders. And we're trying to take steps that we can to, to, to manage that and maintain that relationship because even though it took a 90% guarantee, this lender is working in our community. And we don't wanna just slam the door on them 
because unfortunately we don't have the budget authority to serve everybody that we would like to serve. Our funds are limited and we have statutory limitations from Congress on how long we can maintain those relationships. So absolutely get in touch with your bank, get in touch with your local office, however, you know, as many different pathways as you can. Can I be next? <laughs> I actually got, Zach, I don't know what your schedule is, but I, I got I got one at 11, I gotta get on. Uh, thank you. Uh, I look forward to getting the questions. And just so you know, what we've been doing is taking these questions. And if there is an issue that was brought up today that is not, not already addressed in the frequently asked questions, we will modify the frequently asked questions to reflect the answers to that question. So those questions are important. And, and let's make sure we get them so we can continue to develop this process. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, my friend. And Dr. York, if, if, if you have time, I've got a little more time and there's one really important issue that I'd like to hit on, if you don't mind. Please, thank you. You bet. Uh, the question's been asked about the lawsuits in Texas and Wisconsin. And will those hold anything up? We're moving ahead as though we're still on track to do the things that our timeline says that we can do. So while there may be folks out there who are unhappy about this, that's a separate process. We're in the executive branch and we're gonna take executive branch steps to get these payments out to our producers just as quickly as we can. Okay. Um, do you have a, a moment for an additional question or is that it, Dr. Dusha? I sure okay. do. I, you know, I've got 15, 20 minutes. If you okay. want to Allison, would you let time? him continue? Yeah. I do know that Dr. McMeans will have to log off. And so thank you to Dr. McMeans um, for being a part of today. Um, he does have um, some traveling to do. So we'll continue on. Um, for those of you all that can stay on, please do. Um, thank you to um, Dr. Goldman and Dr. McMeans. All right, thank you, and, and thank you, Zach, and, and thank you, Dr. York, and uh, sorry I have to jump off, but I, I have to catch a plane, but uh, uh, but I just want to thank everybody for, uh, especially our team and the USDA partners, and I was so happy to see that we had a lot of 1890s on the line, those that I saw, because we maxed out on, 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 the, on the regular numbers, but also uh, the liaisons that I've seen. So I just want to thank all of you guys for your participation and hopefully we can have some follow up uh, in a future webinar. So uh, thank you and I'll uh, and be in touch. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Dr. McMeans. Before you leave, I want to say thank you. <laughs> thank you, you for allowing USDA to partner with you on this webinar. We're, we're so appreciative. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys. Thank you, Dr. McMeans. Dr. Ducheneau, we'll turn it back over to you and Allison Johnson for as many more questions as you can take. Um, we'll stay on. Thank you. Okay, we're going to jump into the chat. In what form will the debt relief be delivered? By check, direct deposit, payment directly, FSA, a guaranteed lender. This is from Micah Buzzard. Uh, also, second part to that, do we need to contact a bank who has a loan guaranteed by FSA? And I think you somewhat answered that. Yeah, we touched on that just a little bit, but I'll talk about the form of payment. That's one of the things that we're trying to work out. Whichever we can do the quickest is the, is the method we'll take. But the lender will get their amount directly, whether it's the FSA or the guaranteed lender, and the, the borrower will get that 20% amount separate from that, either by direct deposit or check. You know, we've, we've, there are different software programs, different approval processes behind each of those methods. So we're trying to find the way to build one that's the fastest. Thank you. There's a question from Amanda Croft that says, gender is not included. Aren't women considered a minority within FSA? And I think that is uh, in reference to the AD 2047 form. That's a good question. And what's important to note here, Amanda and everybody else is that 
when Congress established this program, they used the definition of socially disadvantaged from section 2501 of the 1990 Farm Bill. That definition includes Black or African American, Native American or Alaskan Native, Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders or Asian Americans, or of Latino or Hispanic ethnicity. So if you are a woman of one of those categories, you're eligible. If you were a uh, non-SDA female, you do not qualify because of that section 2501 definition. Thank you. What will can be done at the local FSA level about USDA representatives who discriminate against minorities? There needs to be a safe contact who can step in when we are given the runaround. It took us well over a year to get our loan approved as we were always pushed to the back of the line. And if things aren't changed at the local level, they'll be shut out. It will be impossible to purchase additional loans if it takes over a year to get paperwork through the local office. So there's several, several ways to answer that question. The first one is let us know. Get in touch with Mr. Boley send me an email because damn it, I wanna know because we wanna reach out and give that local staff whatever education they need to get on board. We wanna help them. Another thing that, that is really helpful is to have partners like Southern University out there who can help borrowers get to the, get to the office more prepared. Our handbooks are all online. And I'm sure there are folks probably at Southern University that know them better than I do. But I, I spent a lot of time in my previous existence going through those FSA loan making handbooks. I can put the link in the, in the chat here to those handbooks. That's, that's all we can do. We can't operate outside of those handbooks. So if you feel as though that process isn't being followed, you let us know. You elevate that discussion in a thoughtful and respectful manner to the next decision maker in that chain of command. And we can make sure that we're doing our job by the book and the book is public. Thanks, Zach. There's a question here from Keisha Jeffries. Any loans that is given to Native Americans from the USDA, does that include non-federal recognized tribes? That is a really good question. And I'm gonna to need to get your email to be able to answer that because I will have to check with our friends at the Office of General Counsel on what their definition is. But what I can say to that point is that this is a self-certification process. We're treating these borrowers as good as we treat our non-SDA borrowers when it's time for farm program payments. So. If, you've, if you're applying for CFAP on wheat, for example, you fill out a piece of paper that says how many acres you've got, that triggers whatever we do in CFAP. The same process is gonna apply here. You're self-certifying that you are a member of this group. People that would falsify that must understand they're making a false statement to a federal government official and there are significant uh, downsides to that, that chance you're taking. Daniel Smith asked, if my CFAP payment was applied to debt, will it be reimbursed? Any payments that you made towards that debt will be reimbursed based on the amount of indebtedness you had as of January 1st, 2021. So to take that $100,000 example that Dr. Goldman and I have been using, you had $100,000 in debt to the FSA on January 1st. You were eligible for the top-up payment on livestock and you got $5,000 on April 16th. That went towards your loan payment. You're gonna get that money back because the payment is based on the January 1st indebtedness. It's a really good question. 
Thank you. There's a question here from Deborah Reese. Please send contact information for the panel. We will do that. We will put that information in the chat. Uh, she wants to review next steps. And then also, will funds be available for bowl weevil assessments that were assessed? I don't want to give an answer. I think I know the answer, but I want to make sure that I give the right one. So let me get that person's contact information so that I can get that. I presume that Allison, you or someone will be batching these up so that we can get back because we want to get in yes. touch and we want to give the right answer, not just what I think, because as my father and my brothers are very comfortable reminding me, I don't know every damn thing, but sometimes I act like I do. <laughs> Good point, Zach. Yes, we will. I will be working with Southern University and we will get those questions to USDA panelists. So fantastic. I see Ms. Augustine has come on the line. If we have uh, room for one more question, I'll try to get that in, Ms. Augustine. We have a loan that is 50% FSA and 50% private lender. Is this a guaranteed loan? Andre Wingo. Andre, that's a really good question and we've gotten that a lot. The parameters that we have to operate within are very narrowly defined. It has to be an FSA direct loan, so the 50% would be. Unless the lender has a guarantee on their portion, we cannot apply this payment to that because it's the guarantee is a technical legal relationship with the bank different than a participation loan. Okay, I'll sneak in one more. My husband and I are both mixed race and own our farming operation 50-50, Native American, white, and white African American, and have filed the USDA form accordingly. Will we qualify as socially disadvantaged for the debt relief? That's Tiffany. Yes, if you had indebtedness as of January 1st, 2021, and you have filed that form appropriately, you will qualify for the loan payment. One last question. Is there a plan for the federal government to start administering guaranteed loans without utilizing a private bank for socially disadvantaged producers? Because many banks have refused to work with people of color in the past. Uh, that's a very open-ended question. And as I mentioned, we've got only a limited amount of budget authority to do direct loans with. So we have to maintain that relationship with those lenders. Oftentimes that relationship with the lenders isn't fantastic for our producers. We understand that. So we're looking in the future at reaching out to our friends and friends and relatives in the community development financial institutions, the more community-based lenders that aren't your typical commercial lenders to try to engage them in the process. And we really welcome the ideas of the think tanks out there in the country like Southern University and the group that you got here. What's your idea? How do we do more thoughtful investment in agriculture that works for our communities? Because imagine if we can unleash the resilience that our people have to demonstrate just to endure our existence with proper capital. Imagine the innovation that we can demonstrate to the rest of the world. We can show the way for all farmers and have our people of color leading the way in this conversation. There are only like two more questions in there, uh, Dr. Ducheneau. Do you mind if we go on and ask those? Let's get to them. This is okay. some of my favorite okay. stuff to do is talk with our producers. Okay, Allison, just go on and continue until um, we answer all of them or Dr. Ducheneau says stop. <laughs> I'll get those last two, Dr. Okay. York. Okay, so let me find my place again. Uh, <laughs> I, I did not receive the AD 2047 form. Does this mean this program is for those that have loans? Please advise, this is Janice Johnson. So if you did not, so you won't receive an AD 2047 form unless you take the affirmative step of filling it out yourself. If you have an FSA loan and, and 
you want to ensure that we have that designation on file, you can download that AD 2047 form. I put it into the chat window, but I bet I can get with Allison and get everybody that's on the call a list of the frequently asked questions, the AD 2047, and the link to our handbooks so that you all will have those. Uh, there Was there a second part to that question, Allison? No, I don't think so. Okay. No. We do have a question from Dr. Walter Hill, our friend and neighbor over in Alabama, Dean Hill. What is the process for farmers seeking justice relative to Pickford? And Dr. Goldman alluded to that. So there is at least 5% of that $1 billion that is designated specifically for people who have been discriminated against in the past. How do we build a new program that works for folks that still haven't received justice and treat them equitably? So I would, I would ask you, Dr. Hill, what, what's your idea? Share your ideas with us and we, we will do our best to see if we can find a way to build a program that equitably serves all people in that class of socially disadvantaged producers and develop that model. The, the, there's almost no restrictions on what we can do with section 1006. Thank you, Zach. Daniel Smith asks, what if a client passed last year and left equipment and debt? Can the family still qualify for the loan payments? Yeah, and see, there's, there's a lot of those type of details that we're working out within the agency. But based on my knowledge, and I'm, I don't pretend to be a lawyer, but I've, I've read some books, based on my knowledge of the way that would go, there's an estate in that person's name. So that person still has indebtedness and that estate would receive payment unless that estate's been settled and closed. But that if you know anybody in that situation, please have them reach out to me and we can help get them the right answer. Excellent. You mentioned tax bills will be covered by FSA, can be covered by FSA loan. Would that also uh, be the same for an operating loan? Would the tax bills be covered? Uh, I'm making sure I understand the question correctly. Will the tax, so tax obligations are an eligible use of an FSA loan. And Mr. Boley can probably step in here and correct me if I get too far afield. I have a very aspirational reading of the handbook. Uh, an operating loan, I, I would suggest not doing an, an annual operating loan to make those tax payments. I would suggest take advantage of the, the, the term note so that you can pay that over time. Otherwise you're just moving that big obligation from here to next fall and it's still gonna be the same. So think about using our loan products to term that out and build a plan that does that. We have a question from Travis Johnson. Will FSA loan have been accountable for continuous discrimination towards underserved and socially disadvantaged farmers if, produce, if proven? The, I'm sorry, you kind of broke up there a little bit on, okay, I see the question here. Okay. Will FSA loan staff be held accountable for the continuous discrimination towards underserved and socially disadvantaged producers if proven? If there is any way that I can, you bet your bottom dollar, I'm going to deal with those folks. If we can find that and get those folks the right help they need to have a proper perspective in the world, dang right. If we can't help them improve their perspective, we will find ways to hold them accountable. Okay, there's a question in the chat about whether or not the recording will be saved. Yes, it will. And you, you will be able to find the recording later this afternoon on the SU Ag Center website. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ducheneau. And thank you for um, staying over with us and, and answering those additional questions. Um, Ms. Allison, do you have any closing remarks before we adjourn? 
Yes, thank you so much, uh, Dr. York. And thank you so much, uh, Zanetta Augustine and the Southern University team. I'm, I'm extremely, uh, I'm an extremely grateful partner. Uh, we've been working together for years. I am an alum, but uh, it's, it's an awesome opportunity and experience to come back and be a partner with my 1890 institution, uh, Southern University as a USDA liaison. Uh, as we work to serve the uh, customers and stakeholders uh, throughout the state of Louisiana, I am now uh, serving under Dr. Lisa Ramirez in the Office of Partnerships and Public Engagement as the National Outreach Coordinator for the East, managing 25 states on the eastern half of the U.S. Uh, in partnership with Zach and Dwayne, and I'm grateful for their participation today and uh, Terry coming on board and really appreciate USDA. Uh, uh, participating in this webinar today as a, as a partner. And we hope to, uh, we hope that we've provided our contact information in the chat to all participants and please reach out to us. Uh, uh, part of what Tarek and I do on the ground is we uh, make sure that we maintain and, and improve and increase uh, relationships and program participation out in the field and with our USDA programs nationwide. So we want to make sure that we get the information and concerns back to leadership and headquarters so that we can properly address your questions and concerns. Uh, just appreciative uh, of the 1890s and partnering with the USDA liaisons nationwide. And want to thank our USDA partners, Zach, our USDA internal partners for joining us for this call today. So greatly appreciate, appreciative of you guys uh, participating. Thank you so much, Dr. York. It's been okay, my pleasure. And thank you again. Thank you again to Dr. Doshino, I mean, Mr. Doshino and Dr. Goldman. This has been um, a wealth of information and we are so indebted to you for taking out time and coming and being with us today. Um, we will get all of those questions to you all so that you can look over them and see if um, they need to be added to the frequently asked questions. If there's anything that we can do for you or anyone who is in attendance today, please email us. We have put um, different email addresses into the chat box. Also, the entire webinar will be posted to our website, www.suagcenter.com. That should be by later today. If you have any additional questions after viewing that, you are welcome to contact any of us. Please know that the SU Ag Center Cooperative Extension Service is here to serve. You can call us, you can email us, you can just stop by, you can text. We are here. Uh, it doesn't end today. So um, anything that you think of, please give us a call, okay? Thank you guys and have a great evening.